Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about the innovative work of Game Heads, an organization based in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area in California, with special guest Damon Packwood, co-founder and executive director of Game Heads, located in Oakland. So it's so great to see you, Damon. And and we've been talking off camera about you know what you're what you're doing uh, there in Oakland, and let's just talk about the setting. I mean, you founded this this uh, organization uh, in Oakland, Oakland being situated in one of the tech centers of the world. So, mm-hmm. talk about your thinking of taking this idea of tech and gamification and uh, coding skills and so on, and bringing them into um, into places where you can grab the energy, the creativity of Oaklandites, of Oakland students uh, for this incredible experience that can engage anyone. So, you know, the, the question around, you know, you know, what was my thinking as far as starting game hits here in Oakland? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, you know, to, to your point, one, Oakland is is sandwiched right between Silicon Valley and San Francisco. I'm actually a San Francisco native. So, you know, uh, and I've been here pretty much my entire life. So I saw the tech industry kind of, you know, blow up. Um, but the thing that, that you know, I've, I've been in education for many, many years, and I always knew that statistically speaking, in public education, you know, black and brown students don't, you know, we don't really excel very much in STEM, right? It's not anything wrong with the demographics necessarily. It's just that there's not a there's not strong STEM programs in California, right? So, how are people going to transition into the tech industry? And that that was a big question that everybody was asking. It's like, yo, this is the dominant industry. How are we going to get our students to transition? And everybody was like, let's teach them how to code. But I'm like, you know, a lot of the people that were saying teach them how to code were not programmers they were not coders like i actually knew how to code and i and i learned later in life so i knew how difficult it was and how in some cases it's not very interesting right it depends on the person right it's it's a theoretical suggestion oh teach them to code right and, yeah. and it's theoretical so you don't you don't really connect the dots of how does that actually function right exactly it's like you know if if they're not performing well in math and anybody knows that if you don't perform well in math, most likely your parents didn't perform well in math and then their parents didn't perform well in math. So if you're going to have to be adept at STEM, it's generational, but it's like, we need people to learn how to do this today. So what do we do to get them to learn how to do this today? Because the thing that's at stake is that they can't afford to live in the Bay Area. They ha- they're forced to move out. And so these like communities that have been around since the 50s, are deteriorating and it's because of the tech industry and they can't get into the tech industry. So what do you do? Well, one thing that I knew was like, all right, well, what are they good at, right? Like, what are we really, really good at in the Bay Area in California? And it's really like visual and performance arts, right? So I'm like, okay, how does that translate into the tech industry? And then that's when I started getting fascinated with the video game industry because the video game industry, while it does require engineers, you're also looking at sound designers, motion capture actors, voice actors, artists, animators, people that are interested in media, project managers, which is all around organizers. Like we have a, a, um, a, a history of organizing in the Bay Area or, um, you know, entertainers, athletes uh, and, um, <clears throat> you know, um, level designers or just people that are, like playing video games. That's that's called quality assurance. There are some people that just love playing video games and the percentage of black and brown folks that play video games, they, they over index, right? So what I started looking at the research, I noticed that black and brown folks actually over index in video games. They play more, uh, they play like 30, 30 minutes more per day. They um, are more likely to call themselves a gamer and things of that nature. So it just seemed like the perfect marriage Right. Like if you can teach them these things that they already understand and they're already good at. Now, the only thing you have to do is introduce them to the hardware and the software. That's what they don't have access to or what they don't understand. 
but they walk into the classroom having an ideal of what you're teaching them as opposed to coding. I've taught coding. I mean, I've taught coding, excuse me. They walk into the class and they have no idea what they're doing. So you have to start from zero. Whereas with games, you're not starting from zero. You're starting from like five. And I thought that uh, theoretically, because again, it was a theory that it would be a little bit easier to teach them game design and development than it would to teach them engineering. I love how, and I, I'm so appreciative that you're sharing this with me and with us uh, through this program. I love how you connect the dots in this very sophisticated way. Oakland is, from an arts perspective, is the most interesting place within a 75-mile radius of San Francisco. If you just draw a circle around San Francisco, 75 miles, Oakland, of of all, uh, you know, whether it's uh, the restaurants, uh, you know, the, the whole um, uh, experience of, of, of great food or mm -hmm. music, phenomenal visual arts, phenomenal theatrical performance, phenomenal. That mm -hmm. burst of creativity that also comes from youth, but then there are the impediments that you outlined in trying to use those skills to um, to th thrive economically. So basically, unless that's addressed, you can have this creativity, but but it becomes ghettoized into a creativity that only gets consumed by people in your immediate neighborhood. Now, what you've done here is you basically blasted open those doors. How do you actually go from the theory of making something fun, a storytelling in, in a way that does require now math skills and project management skills and art skills, and you're bringing it all together into one product. How do you create an organization that does that? And I know it starts with funding. So talk about your founding and how you were able to assemble the resources required. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it was the sequential. You did a lot of stuff in parallel, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the interesting thing is, I kind of knew this. I didn't think it was going to be as bad as it was, but I knew in the beginning we weren't going to get a lot of attention because everything was on engineering. Um, but I was looking at the data. And one thing that I knew, I, I originally majored in film when I was in college. So when I looked at the video game industry, I, I could tell, OK, this is an entertainment industry that is is gradually increasing. It, it hasn't decreased at all. It looks very similar to the way the film industry looked in the early 1900s. And eventually, because it's technology, it's going to move faster and it's going to hit where the film industry hit in around the 70s and 80s, where they're like, we need diversity. Right. So eventually that's going to happen. And and if you look at the, cons the census data in the United States, you could also see that diversity was increasing right in the united states so i'm like it, at some point they're going to put two and two together and then if you're paying attention to technological increases in you know um what do they call the global south right you can see that you know south america and africa is coming online and typically as soon as people come online they want to play video games so this is all going to change but in the meantime we have to fund it right so what we what we did is we partnered. Wait a second. Wait a second. So, so this is this is really important. What you're saying is a really important point. You're saying you said in your previous segment that that um, uh, black and brown uh, folks will um, are, are larger consumers on average mm -hmm. uh, or the largest consumers on average of video games. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you're saying you ain't seen nothing yet, folks, because you've got a whole new cohort of market and where's that market coming from? It's going to be black and brown folks. And it's going to be on an international basis, right? Yep. And then you're saying the next thing, which is in order to connect to those consumers, those consumers have to become the creators, right? Exactly. And I said, it, it's only a matter of time before they see this and there's historical precedent, right? So it just makes all the sense in the world. Um, so the first thing that I did is I partnered with an organization called United Roots um, and we went in on a grant. They gave me like $30,000 or something like that, which was just enough for me to pay 
you know, my bills. Uh, after that, uh, we leveraged that $30,000 to create, um, you know, um, a prototype of what it would look like our first year. And then I applied for the Echo and Green Fellowship. Uh, Echo and Green was like, we've never seen any idea like this. Like nobody's ever come to us. You know, Echo and Green's been around. You know, Michelle Obama's an Echo and Green fellow. Like Van Jones is an Echo and Green fellow. You know, so they're like, we've never seen anybody use video games in this way before. Um, so they, you know, I, I was very fortunate to get the Echo and Green Fellowship and they gave me like $80,000 over two years. So that kept me afloat. But what we had to do is we had to continue to generate, you know, I mean, you, I don't, I shouldn't have to tell you this. If you're a nonprofit, it's going to take you about three years, right? You know, you have to have, it's three years to, if you're lucky. Yeah, if you're lucky, exactly. Like if you have a theory of change, it takes you three years to prove your theory of change. So our goal was we need to stay afloat for three years so we can prove to people our theory of change. And sure enough, when we hit our third year and we had a really good showing of our students and we gradually increased every year, that's when the video game industry started to take notice. They, they took notice very early, but we were smart. What we did is we went after employees. We didn't have we didn't go after the companies. We went after the employees and we said, hey, help us out by volunteering. And so when they volunteered, they're like, oh my God, I wish I had something like this when I was young. And every time we heard that, we knew we were onto something. Um, and then of course, um, the tech industry was, was aware of the importance of diversity, but the gaming industry was slow. It wasn't until 2020 that the video game industry, it clicked that they needed to start focusing on diversity. And when they did that, they looked around and asked themselves, which organizations are doing this? And we were one of like maybe two or three. And that was let's when- Let's talk we about, let's, let us let me interrupt you there. Let's talk yeah. about diversity as a hard-nosed business strategy that has nothing to do with justice. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about that for a second. Yep. Is what you're saying that- you know, let's leave aside the justice piece. Let's leave aside the fact that people have been shut out of certain professions. Is what you're saying is that market dynamics require, require that you have diversely talented people with different perspectives, lives experience, because if you're creating games, if the other, per if the person on the other side of that screen or those goggles is going to feel that immersive impact. It has to come from a place of truth. And mm -hmm. if that person is, you know, a, a, a young person who is uh, brown or black or, or Asian or South, South Asian, East Asian, whatever, right? Or rich or poor or tall or white or, or old or young, Right. They have to feel that authenticity. If you're going to connect to the market, you yep. have to have creators who are diversely connected to that diverse market. Right. I mean, it's a business strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. And Mark, what you're what you're really getting at is, you know, and it, it's a little difficult for people to wrap their minds around it. And I can tell you, you're kind of getting it is. On one end, I'm seeing that there's a need to teach these skills to young folks. Right. And that there's this industry that they can transition to that's going to pay very, very well. And they're really interested in it. On the other end, if you're paying close attention to the gaming industry, they are heavily criticized for being terrible with diversity over the last 40 years. Like heavily criticized. Their depiction of women and people of color are terrible, right? Leaving, and, girls, leaving girls, yeah. Horrible, right? And... If you look at the data, the number of uh, the, inc the the percentage of like women, for example, that are playing video games is increasing and the percentage of people of color that play video games is already high. Just nobody talks about it. So well, I'm like, look at the Barbie movie, all right? That, together? that film has just exploded, right? That The, the Barbie movie, which I've not seen yet, but I've, mm -hmm. I've got to mm -hmm. see it. Right? I mean, we, we've got to see it, right? 
And if you look at that, at that film, what they basically have done is they've become the largest grossing film by tapping into not only a market that has been film goers before, but there are all these people who are just like, got to see this, this, this movie. It's a new market. That's what you're talking about. Exactly. And that market was already always there. They just weren't paying attention to it. So I was, you know, in addition to creating the program, you know, developing the program, I was also capturing the data and writing articles and putting the articles out there so that eventually they're going to they're going to get it. And when they get it, they're going to do some research and they're going to find us. Right. So that was always the plan. Um, you know, when, when we started the program and, and fortunately it kind of worked out. And then now sort of fast forward, you have a quite a range of different programs. So talk about how your, um, your process works when a young person comes in, uh, what they experience, and then where do they go from here? In other words, are you having the impact, the measurable impact, because metrics is really important, right? Mm -hmm. In games, right? You keep score. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep score? Yeah, I mean, what I always say is, um, you know, if you want to solve a complex problem, you have your, your solution has to address multiple problems, right? So complex problems are, 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 or, or big problems always have very complex um, dynamics, right? So what you're trying to solve has to solve multiple problems. Um, and the reason why you need that is because you're going to have to talk to other people. So, for example, when it comes to STEM education, when you say it's just a math issue, that's it. But it's not just a math issue. It's a generational issue. It's a political issue. It's who's in office. It's funding. There's so many uh, aspects to it. So the goals of our program are not just games. That's what everybody assumes. The goal of the program is that our students are going to graduate from high school. They're going to enroll in a college majoring in science, technology, engineering, art, or math. They're going to get into a city college and transition from a city college to a four-year university. They're going to graduate from a four-year university. They're going to work on tech projects one per year. They're going to have mentors every year. Um, they're going to get an internship or an externship while they're in college. And when they're done with all of that, they can choose not to enter into the video game industry. It's really up to them. But by then they are qualified and competitive to move in the video game or tech industry. And that's what we've, we've, we've noticed. Um, so when the students get into our program, it's 10 months per year, six months of in-class instruction, 15 weeks of full production during the summer, uh, and then uh, another six or so weeks of polishing and then they release their project at the end of the year. Then we take a couple of weeks off. They come back the next year. We scaffold their learning because by then they've decided kind of where they want to focus, right? Engineering, art animation, sound design, project management, et cetera, et cetera. So we scaffold their learning so that they're getting more deep knowledge. And then we do it again. And then they come back the next year. We scaffold again. And then we do it again. And then by then they're in college. And so when they're in college, we're providing them with wraparound services, hardware, software, scholarships, mentorship, therapy um, and, uh, you know, video games because they're expensive and things of that nature. We provide them with those wraparound services. So there's nothing that's in their way of learning, which is, you know, if you're a parent that makes a lot of money, that's exactly what you would do for your child. Most of our students are low income. So we kind of serve as their surrogate parents and we make sure that all of the things that we're providing for them are the things that you know that that you could provide for them if you had the means they're also being very subversive right because you're making learning fun right you're making learning income directed a lot of the the uh criticisms of our public school systems where most of us get educated and particularly if we're low income mm -hmm. um is is that uh, learning is by rote. It's not fun. It's not creative, and it doesn't lead to any income. There are too many yep. theoretical subjects that that don't actually lead to to um, to uh, dealing with the income issue that's going to obsess us for most of our lives. Whereas mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're providing 
project management guidance, right? So you're learning those executive function skills, but even at a higher level, because you have to bring together differently talented individuals in order to produce one, one game, right? Absolutely. Yep. So you're right. I mean, one, we have a rule where if it's not exciting, cut it out. If it's not fun, if it's not exciting, if it's not cool, cut it out. Anything that's not fun or exciting, remove it. So when you come into our office, you're not going to see any administrative staff, like none. All of our administrative staff are not in our building. They're offsite. When the students come in, they only see fun. And then anything that's kind of rote and boring, we cut it completely out. And to your point, yeah, they get to, don't get me wrong, like we work hard and it's a very rigorous organization, but they're surrounded by video games. They're surrounded by anime. They're surrounded by movies. Um, all of the media that we produce is not like the, it's not our staff, it's our students. Our students are our media team, right? So that's what makes the, the project fun is that we almost function like a video game company right? Like I always tell people Game Heads is a, is a bad tech company, right? Like we hire people that are not qualified, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we train them up until they are. But that's also the reason why we tend to produce very talented students because they're having fun while they're learning. And we put them in the position to be developers and sort of media technicians, you know, IT folks. A lot of the stuff that's that's actually built out in our space, like our, our IT infrastructure was created by our students. Like most of that stuff is created by our students. It's, it's really fascinating. And, and so what is the next uh, stage? If you look three years into, into the future, what mm -hmm. do you see uh, for both your students and for the organization itself as you continue to evolve? Because Things aren't staying still, right? The gaming field is is really evolving. The technology basis is evol evolving, and what I've seen is sometimes people who they reach a a level of success, and then they then they sort of continue to try and just do the same things. In this, this space, you keep doing the same things, you're kind of doomed. Uh, where do you go in the next three years? Yeah. Um, so one, we're we're investing heavily in virtual production. So right now, uh, virtual production is the future of sort of the film industry. The film industry is borrowing a lot of um, workflows from the gaming industry using Unreal Engine, Engine and a lot of sort of workflows that the video game industry has innovated over the last 40 years. So we have a virtual production studio and we're expanding that and then reaching out and working with like, you know, uh, Sony Film, Sony TV, ILM, uh, these guys. So we're expanding beyond the video game industry. Um, also, uh, we know AI is right around the corner. So that's something that we're going to have to, you know, really focus in on because AI is disrupting everything. I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation really have it figured out. They're like, we don't really know where tech is going to go, but we know that math is going to be really important. So we're probably going to start offering math classes. Um, and I think that by combining math classes with the video games, I think we can kind of figure out how to make it fun and interesting. Um, and then there's also expansion. You know, some markets, you know, we're in the Bay, so the Bay's moving fast, but there's some markets that are about five, 10 years behind. So we're looking at cities that are five, 10 years behind, trying to get them there and then letting the Bay Area be where we innovate, because if they're five, 10 years behind, they'll be where we're at now. Um, and then, like I always tell people, but don't count those cities out. I mean, when you look at when you travel around these the, the, these uh, uh, the, these United States, you go to mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, you go to a Cleveland, you go to the places that are that are seen as part of sort of the once great industrial base of the United States, or Detroit, right? You see, mm -hmm. like in Oakland, you see that sort of thriving creativity, the snap, crackle, and pop that is right there. And if you get a virtual environment as opposed to a physical one in which creators can actually collaborate yep. across distance, man, that could be powerful. Yeah, and, and we actually started a virtual program during the pandemic. So we have students now in 17 different states that do interact with our students in the Bay Area. So that's already happening. What we're looking at now, and to your point, I always have this saying, don't create video games, create culture, right? So what I'm always looking at is I'm always looking at cultural hubs. So you, you, you made a great point. 
Detroit's a cultural hub, right? It's just that the culture that they were known for has deteriorated, but that legacy is still there, right? Same goes for New Orleans or Atlanta or Philly or Honolulu. So we're looking at these cultural hubs that have a reputation of of producing really, really great work in the United States. And we're asking ourselves, just like Oakland, because Oakland was a big cultural hub, then the industry in Oakland deteriorated, right? How do we go in there and, and take that very same culture, but bring it into the 21st century? And what cities are those? So you're, you're, you're right on. That's exactly what we're looking at. Well, you're taking the space. Damon Packwood, co-founder and executive director of Gameheads in Oakland, California. It is so great, so great to be able to check in with you. Let's do it again. Let's let's do it in about uh, eight or nine months and see how your plans are are progressing. And boy, I, I just like to thank you, but I but your staff, your funders, and the young people who are participating in this program because what they're doing is they're helping you to build, and that's really important, right? Their creativity, you pointed out, you've actually asked people who are engaged in the program to design your organization, to design your infrastructure. So they deserve a huge amount of credit for your success as well. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah.